This is lecture three on research cycle. The more specific focus is about how to generate a research question and how the research cycle works. Okay, in order to conduct a research, you need a research question and how you're going to come up with a research question. Okay, and so the key idea here that you need to understand is uh, the research question influence the type of research that you conduct. And then, more importantly, when you think about research question, you have to recognize that you cannot ask a research question if you do not know how to articulate the question. So, because I think you are, right now, you are thinking, what the hell he is talking about? So, I'm going to use this using the kind of history of psychology in the past and how we developed this current way of thinking. So uh, the, this is the basically very quick tour of history of psychology or psychological thinking. The, uh, the most intuitive and common sense understanding of how our mind works is, uh, is called Cartesian proposed by Descartes. Okay? It's exemplified by the statement like, I think, therefore, I am. So this assumes that there is some essence of you as a kind of person as a whole who is capable of thinking with a free will exists. However, this is a dead end as a scientific research question because everything is attributed to free will. Anything is possible. There is no mechanism. So that's a problem. On the other hand, the Freud actually made a big leap was of step. The reason why is Freud reduced this people's ability to engage in complex thinking and feeling uh, by proposing more mechanistic view uh, based on three different what he called psyche, like uh, ego, id, and superego. I'm not going to talk about the specific, but everybody knows that ego and id and superego is dedicated for very specific purpose, therefore each of them are stupid and very simple. However, the combination and the dynamic between these three produces something interesting. That's namely the mechanism by which uh, the people think or feel. Okay, And then third step is actually moving toward behaviorism. This is a big conceptual as well as methodological leap. The reason why is now behaviorists come up with a very simple framework of stimulus and response. And so the purpose of psychology should be focused on describing the relation between uh, the stimulus and response. And the key idea here is both stimulus and response is directly observable. Okay, uh, The only problem with the behavioristic approach is uh, they focused on these things that's external. So all the behaviors, uh, behavior outcome or response, is attributed to the stimulus that's actually impinged upon people. But, but that's not, the, our common sense tells that people's response to a stimulus depends on people's understanding of the stimulus. Okay. So the understanding, in order to actually uh, describe or explain the people's behavior in response to a stimulus, the model needs to also include something called understanding, which is missing from behaviorism. Here, the cognitivism or uh, the cognitive psychology is uh, influential and useful because cognitive psychology assumes that people are like information processing machinery like computer that operating based on the specific rules or a kind of software or a mechanism. So now the job of psychologist, according to the cognitivism, becomes identifying specific software or function that help people understand external stimuli such that people respond to the stimuli in an appropriate and adaptive way. So as you see, uh, which perspective that you apply, such as cognitive psychology or behaviorism, is going to dictate and shape your question. For example, if you apply 
behaviorist perspective, your question is going to be mostly about what is the antecedent condition that means stimulus that uh, influence people's behavior. On the other hand, if you uh, adapt cognitive perspective, you can also start asking about how a particular kinds of stimuli is interpreted through different kinds of mechanism employed at the time of processing a stimuli and to produce response. Okay, so uh, that determines the kind of theoretical perspective. That's the, the biggest context in which your research happens. So the theory is, uh, so here, you will see a phrase such as theoretically motivated or driven question. This means, uh, the, this actually reflects the fact that entire science as the movement progress by building the interconnection between layers of knowledge and the more fu most fundamental level, the, in which the most fundamental le level is a theory. So I'm going to explain the relation between theory and actual research in the following slide using examples. Okay. So theory generate more specific hypotheses, such as, for example, uh, we these days we understand that men to be more promiscuous than women. Okay. So, for example, one theoretical perspective that's commonly accepted is this is based on natural selection. So, we are, are using uh, natural selection, Darwinian perspective, evolution as a theoretical background to understand this phenomenon of promiscuity in men is due to larger reproductive capacity uh, that adapt people to uh, pursue certain kinds of strategy which is different from women. Okay, so uh, that's the hypothesis. And then if you have this hypothesis, based on this hypothesis, based on much more general theory of natural selection and evolution, people can generate the specific prediction in a specific situation. That becomes the idea of research. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. So here, uh, I try to capture this relation of theory to hypothesis to a specific study. So theory is the kind of the background or the sources that provide the largest kind of network of knowledge which strive to be consistent, okay, mutually consistent. And then the theory uh, uh, generate a specific hypothesis such as the one that we talked about. If uh, the 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 people's kind of sexual preference is determined by natural selection, which is basically uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, uh, the, the men's promiscuity is actually can be understood as adaptive behavior. In that case, that if that's the hypothesis, that should generate more specific predictions. Like in the survey responding to uh, what's the, uh, you know, how likely that how comfortable you are to have a casual sex uh, with a person that you meet in a bar, okay? And there should be some difference between male and female. So as in this way, a theory generate hypothesis and hypothesis generate the specific study, and then results of the study is going to strengthen or modify the hypothesis, and then uh, because of that effect from the study, the hypothesis is gonna be gradually modified, and that influenced the theory. And that is the basically the overall structure of scientific enterprise. So let's look at this in a way the more specific examples. Okay, here I'm using an example of a general theory uh, called attribution theory. This is an oversimplified version. So it's a, uh, to make a case, okay. So uh, uh, attribution theory is like people try to explain cause of their own behavior by attributing its cause to various sources. And so this means uh, there are two different kinds of attribution. That's a, the attribution to the situation and attribute to your own kind of internal state. So this generates the specific hypothesis. So if the attribution is the underlying 
and a phenom psychological phenomenon uh, to understand the meaning of one's behavior or uh, one's internal state. Uh, people may sometimes misattribute the cause of their behavior when two or more salient sources are available. So this generates a specific prediction or a specific situation uh, in which this attribution hypothesis of attribution error can be tested. So I'm going to use the example of Dutton and Aaron study in 1974 to see how this works. In Dutton and Aron study in 1974, participants crossed either slightly arousing, sturdy, low bridge, or highly arousing, precarious, suspended bridge. These are psychology students at the university. At the end of the bridge, a female interviewer asked these male participants to take part in the survey for uh, uh, the psychology class. Okay? After completing the survey, the interviewer, here it says her psychology class, but it's actually a mistake. It's his psychology class because all the participants are male. After completing the survey, the interviewer gave the participants a name and number and offered to explain the experiment in more details when she had more time. So this implies that inviting the participants to call her, okay, by giving her personal phone number. So the interest of the research is this. Okay, so the logic is this. Number of willingly surveyed participants who actually made a call to the interviewer uh, was interpreted as the indicator of sexual attraction. So it's a dependent variable is the number of people across two conditions, one crossing the safe bridge, the other crossing the more exciting bridge. Uh, actually calling back. How many, what's the proportion of those people who crossed these two different kinds of bridge called her is an dependent variable to measure uh, the, the level of sexual attraction. And uh, the hypothesis by Dutton and Aaron is these levels of sexual attractions are different based on the crossing the bridge. And what they found is between the two conditions, participants in the experimental Precarious bridge condition return higher scores of sexual attraction. This means they, uh, uh, these people pro crossing the more dangerous bridge, uh, call the experimenter more. Okay, so uh, the conclusion is externally induced arousal caused by the bridge tends to cause people to misattribute and misunderstand their own internal state. So the high arousal is interpreted as a sexual attraction to the interviewer. That's the basically the conclusion. Okay, so one discussion I would like you to think is, is this finding conclusive enough in itself for providing a support to the view that situation or attribution can cause people to misattribute the source of their arousal? So this means uh, I would like you to think about whether or not this evidence, this study is sufficient in uh, concluding that the people can actually misunderstand uh, uh, the, the internal arousal caused by the bridge is actually misunderstood to be the sexual attraction. So one problem that I recognize here is actually uh, the way that I describe, basically participants are not randomly assigned to these two different kinds of bridges. So people actually self-selectingly uh, walking either, choosing either, a uh, uh, dangerous bridge or a sturdy bridge. So it may be the crossing either the, these two different kinds of bridge is already affected by pre-existing personality. Namely, people actually crossing the dangerous bridge is more risk-taking people, therefore uh, sensation-seeking. And this, may, uh, this uh, in part explains the behavior. If you are sensation-seeking, you are more likely to call uh, this attractive experiment. That's an alternative kind of interpretation. Therefore, I would like you to think, uh, so single experiment is always uh, not sufficient in leading to the conclusion, clear conclusion. Multiple experiments are needed because there are multiple possible interpretations are possible. So I would like you to think, continue to think, what would be the second experiment to follow up to really nail 
uh, whether or not the hypothesis is actually true. Okay. So as you can see, based on this uh, uh, kind of as a summary, I'm going to provide. Okay, the research cycle typically begins with a question. Question uh, is probably based on your intuition, but then you're going to read uh, a lot of literature, and then you try to see how other existing research talk about the same research question that you have as a vague intuitive question. That help you to refine the question, uh, think about what is the useful concept that is existing in the literature, and then further define the hypothesis based on the literature review. And then finally, uh, you are going to start thinking about what is the method that's used by the previous research. And that reading this literature allow you to define the method. And then you're going to do the data correction. And uh, data correction uh, results in the, res uh, uh, the actual specific finding. And this specific finding is going to modify your initial thinking. And that continues. And continuously uh, defined method, continuously defined research question, and your theory and hypothesis is going to uh, lead to the better understanding overall. That's how science progress. And I hope you understood, you asked me. Uh, this help you understand the science. Okay, so uh, the the one more things that I need to talk about is, given the uh, the the research cycle described in the previous slide, requires literature review. There are uh, you need to become familiar with the uh, the search technique of database, PsychInfo, Google Scholar, and a Social Science Citation Index, which I described here, are three uh, some key uh, search engine that you can use to do the literature search. Okay, so uh, also I would like you to kind of note that this idea of research cycle is actually reflected and represented and embodied in APA style lighting, especially the divide of the sections. Introduction, you generate the research question, justify the meaning and importance of research question in relation to pre-existing research. Then uh, you also justify what method is needed toward the end of introduction, and then you have a full detailed method, methodological description in the method, and then the results talks about the actual finding, often using quantitative description using statistical inference, and then in the discussion, you are going to address the question raised in the introduction section based on the results given the method. So the discussion always needs to address all the question and issue used in the introduction using the full details of all the aspects of the results. 